Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome back. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Torah portion reading. I'm Adam, your host, and I welcome you. This is week three, Lech Lecha, which is uh, Genesis 12 through 17. And this is this is a big Torah portion. Um, this is Abraham. This is all about uh, meeting and getting to know Abraham, the father of faith. Um, man, there's so much to discuss. Let me just not ramble on. Let's start with prayer and let's just get into tonight. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we come before you and bless you and praise you and thank you and love you in Yahusha's name. Father, we pray that as we go through these uh, scriptures tonight, Father, that you'd open our eyes and ears to seeing and hearing the wondrous things written in your Torah, Father. And we just pray that you would help us to become uh, Psalm 1 trees that are nourished, that are washed by and nourished by the waters, Father, that we may have leaves that never fade and may have fruit, um, that is abundant and the fruit that you desire father uh, we just we love you and we thank you and we say shabbat shalom to you and just thank you in yahushua's name amen man yeah it's good <laughs> let's um a little shofar and let's do a little live show of our action let's do that's the big boy today Let's do this. So, this, like I said, this is a this is a big Torah portion because we are supposed to be the seed of Abraham, and as Messiah said, we'll read it here in a second that uh, you know if we were Abraham's children, if we were the seed of Abraham, we would do the deeds of Abraham. So we've got a lot to learn. We got a lot to um, we got some big footsteps to walk in. Right, we're supposed to walk as like Messiah walked. We're supposed to walk like Abraham walked in full assurance of faith in the Most High, uh, just giving ourselves fully to Him, fully submitting to Him in everything that we have, not leaving an inch or even a speck of our heart to another way. So let's get started with um, some words from Paul. In Galatians 3, 28-29, There is neither uh, Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah Husha. And if you be Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Just to confirm, right, Abraham's seed, who that is, Isaiah 41, 8, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. So if you're Messiahs, then you're Abraham's seed, and if you're Abraham's seed, you are Israel, regardless of your bloodline, regardless of your race, your skin color. There's a lot of skin color preachings out there. Um, here in the in the time frame that we're in, we are Israel by faith in Messiah Yahusha. We are either um, blood descendants that have been uh, regrafted back in, or we have no relation to the to the uh, ancestral um, uh, Israelites, and we're grafted in. Doesn't matter. We're all equal. So praise Yah for that. So let's uh, read one more passage here. 
from uh, Enoch. Enoch, this is what, Enoch 83? No, 93. And um, this is the dream. I've read this quite a few, quite a few times on the in this ministry. And this is the ten weeks of time that Enoch is given for um, for the, for history, and it goes through everything, like the, you know, his flood, Abraham, uh, the twelve patriarch. I mean, it goes through everything. And so we're just going to skip down here to the sixth week, and this is the time of the Pharisees, and this is the time of our Messiah. And after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded, and all the hearts of them shall godlessly forsake wisdom. And in it, a man shall ascend. This is Messiah, right? He ascended to the throne. And at its close, the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. So this is 70 AD. This is the final dispersion of all the tribes. And after that, in the seventh week, shall an apostate generation arise, and many shall be its deeds, and all its deeds shall be apostate. Right, so this is the time of the uh, Roman Catholic Church, the beast of Revelation, if you will, that kind of took over the faith, killed all the true believers, the Sabbath keepers, so on and so forth, and just gobbled up the faith. And this is the time of primeval silence that uh, Ezra talks about in, I think it's 2 Ezra 6, where he talks about after uh, 400 years, then Messiah shall die, and then the world will be turned back into primeval silence for seven days, one week. Right, So this week, the seventh week, is where this uh, primeval silence, the apostate generation. However... I believe we're at the end of that seventh week where it says, and at its close, so at the end of the seventh week, shall be elected the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness. In the book of Enoch, the seed of Abraham is called the eternal plant of righteousness, the seed of Abraham. So at its close, so at the end of the seventh week, shall be elected. So people will be selected to be the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness. So certain people will be selected from the seed of Abraham to do what? To receive sevenfold instruction concerning all his creation. Uh, and then it goes on to say that these same people will be the ones that will transition into the eighth week uh, and a sword will be given to those people to execute vengeance and judgment. And after, at its close, they will be given houses. Um, so, right, uh, their inheritance in New Jerusalem. So that's to kind of set the stage of us being the seed of Abraham, but to even even be worthy of being called of such we have to be um to understand that the most high yahuwah the father of all right and through him his son yahusha all things were created and all things exist right and that we have to have faith that messiah yahusha he came and he offered himself for us and that by his blood we are cleansed and that it is our duty as israel grafted in or natural born whatever but to walk as messiah walked in spirit and in truth and so we're going to talk a little about uh, uh, spirit in the coming days. A lot of us understanding the truth, but what does it look like to actually walk in the spirit alongside that truth? So, um, all right. So with that, let's uh, let's uh, get started. Genesis 12. Now Yahweh had said unto El Abram, Get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and curse him that curses you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as Yahweh had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So, you know, how many of us have been ready for this call? How many of us have been heeding this call? How many of us have been leaving everything we knew to follow him? For some of us, it co has costed everything. For some of us, it's costed a little, right? So we all have different situations, but nevertheless, you know, are we ready to get up and go at his calling? Matthew 19, 16 through 21. Behold, one came unto him and said, Good master, what thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is Elohim. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Bam, right there, right? Very clearly. And he said unto him, which? Yahushua said, you shall do no murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. So that's commandments five through 10. Why commandments one through four wasn't mentioned here? Um, I don't know. Good question. You know, perhaps... Uh, 
it was taken out of the translation. I don't know, but we obviously know to serve no other Elohim is is paramount. To not worship false images is paramount. Not taking his name in vain is paramount. Of course, the Shabbat, right? So none of these things are forsaken. But nevertheless, the point being is, he said, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And the young man said to him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Yahushua said unto him, if you will be perfect, go and sell that you have and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And, you know, I think this can be taken in many ways. I think you can take it very literal. And for some people that are rich, maybe that's something they have to do. Not all of us are rich. Are all of us, do all of us have the same um, stumbling block in our hearts as this rich young ruler did? Right? That was his stumbling block. His stumbling block was that he was rich and he didn't want to give up his possessions. Not all of us are rich. Not all of us care about our possessions. So do we all have to do that? Maybe, maybe not. I think there's a spiritual lesson to be taken here that really ties in with Abraham. And you can kind of get, uh, we've talked about this before. When you when you look at certain scriptures, especially the Proverbs, you'll get definitions or like keys to unlock other scriptures. Like for example, when Yahusha and the apostles and everybody are talking about light, coming to the light, coming to the light. Well, what are they talking about, right? Are they talking about literally like, like the light of the sun walking in that or what are they talking about and you look at proverbs 6 23 where it says the torah is light and so then you're like oh okay so they were just talking in parable form okay that makes sense so when it talks about selling all you have in in uh things like that proverbs 23 23 is pretty important it says buy the truth and sell it not also wisdom instruction and understanding so in a in a spiritual sense when he says you know um when he says, uh, sell all you have, right? In my understanding, and from what I've seen a lot of people doing, is they've been called out of the world to sell all they have in a uh, wisdom sense. Like everything that we learned growing up in school with um, cosmology, with uh, trusting the medical system, the education system, um, just the list goes on. Trusting politics and what really... You know, it goes on behind the scenes and uh, money and all these things. Like, just sell it all. Get rid of it. It's worthless, right? And so in that kind of sense, we've been doing that. Um, just, and that's, in my opinion, those are some parallels of what Abraham was called to do, right? He was called to leave everything he knew and to, to trust in him and, and walk before him perfectly, keeping his commandments. Well, in a lot of ways, that's, you know, what we're doing. Uh, he hasn't literally... For some people, he's called them out of the country or the country or the state that they live in to move. Um, you know, this there's been a mass movement, you know, to the center of this country uh, for many reasons. And a lot of people are just picking up and leaving everything they have and everything they've ever known to come live out here. Right. Well, I'm one of them. It's just the most wild, bizarre story uh, of how I got here uh, into the Ozarks of Missouri. But anyways, the point being is more important, more importantly, in a doctrinal sense, in a spiritual spiritual sense, if you will, um, just selling all your garbage that the world has sold you. Like the world sells you a bill of goods, right? So you're either, you're either buying the truth of Yah or you're buying what the world has to sell. You're either buying from the Most High or you're buying from Mystery Babylon and all of her tentacles and her ways. And that goes really deep. Everything, you know, what we just mentioned, all, all those sectors that we mentioned, but you know, Hollywood and the music industry and um, it just goes so deep. Um, as to who you're buying from. And so that's why Proverbs says, buy the truth. Don't buy from the world. Buy the truth. Buy the Torah. And don't sell it. Right? Sell the world's goods, but don't sell this. And that comes into play with uh, Mystery Babylon and coming out of her. That's the call we've all been heeding. Some of us have been coming out faster than others, but nevertheless, we're coming out. Revelation 18.4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Abraham was called out. Called out of Ur of the Chaldees. It was called out of Haran. To go to a place he didn't know. In a place full of wicked people. The Canaanites were in the land. These were wicked people. But Abraham was like, okay. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you say. Do we have that in us? I'm asking, I'm asking myself, do we have that in us to leave everything we have and to follow him? We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But just to kind of drive, to finish on the point of 
selling what you have and what and who you're buying from. Revelation 18, 9 through 11. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. This is Mystery Babylon, right? Shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. So let me ask you a question. Are the kings of the earth, are they literally having like physical fornication with Mystery Babylon? Maybe you can make an argument for that. But I think if we can be honest with each other, it's a it's a it's a parable. It's a spiritual sense. There's there's spiritually fornicating with Mystery Babylon. Standing afar off for the fear of their torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is your judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Let's go back to who you're buying and selling from. You're either buying from Mystery Babylon or you're buying from Yahuwah through his son Yahusha and the truth. So uh, that's kind of the intro as to what we're going to be talking about tonight. So where do we leave off? Verse 4. Yeah, so verse 5. And uh, and Abram took Sarai his woman and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem unto the plain of More, and the Canaanite was in the land. And Yahuwah appeared unto El Abram and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto Yahuwah who appeared unto him. So let's uh, let's pause here real quick, and we're going to do a little bit of reading and a little bit of a history lesson. Oh, let me get my blue light blocking glasses. Okay, so let's get a little bit of history lesson here because I really believe the book of Jasher excuse me, the book of Yashar uh, gives us so much context as to exactly what happened, you know, when Abraham left. We get such a paraphrase, we get such a um, uh, an outline of a story of Abraham. We don't get all the, the details. There's so many amazing details of his life that, you know, for whatever reason was not included in the canon. Maybe it's because, well, the father of faith all the amazing things he did, he left those for the wise among the people. Like we read in 2 Ezra 14 that not all books were for the public use. Some books were kept back for the wise. I believe the book of Yashar is one of those books. All right, so let's see what, what Abraham left and he fled from. This is kind of a longer read, but uh, worth it. So we're going to read uh, Yashar chapter 11 through chapter 12, verse 44. So a lot of reading to do here. And Nimrod, son of Cush, was still in the land of Shinar, and he reigned over it and dwelt there. And he built cities in the land of Shinar. And these are the names of the four cities which he built, and he called their names after the occurrences that happened to them in the building of the tower. And he called the first Babel, saying, Because Yahweh there confounded the language of the whole earth. And the name of the second called Erek, because from there Elohim dispersed them. And the third he called Eched, saying, There was a great battle at that place. And the fourth he called Kalna, because his princes and mighty men were consumed there. And they vexed Yahuwah and rebelled and transgressed against him. And when Nimrod had built these cities in the land of Shinar, he placed them the rem the, in them the remainder of his people, his princes and his mighty men that were left in his kingdom. And Nimrod dwelt in Babel, and, there, and he there renewed his reign over the rest of his subjects. And he reigned securely. And the subjects and princes of Nimrod called his name Amraphel, saying that the tower, his princes, and men fell through his means. At the tower, sorry. And notwithstanding this, Nimrod did not return to Yahuwah, and he continued in wickedness and teaching wickedness to the sons of men. And Mardon, his son, was worse than his father, and continued to add to the abominations of his father. And he caused the sons of men to sin, therefore it is said, from the wicked goes forth wickedness. David actually quoted this um, somewhere in Samuel. Yeah. So David said, as the old uh, as the old saying goes, or actually here, as saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon me. All right, so this is when David spares Saul. At that time there was war between the families of the children of Ham as they were dwelling in the cities which they had built. And Cheder Leomer, king of Elam, went away from the families of the children of Ham, and he fought with them and he subdued them. And he went to the five cities of the plain and he fought against them and he subdued them. And they were under his control. And you know what? Let's see. Um, yeah. And they served him 12 years, and they gave him a yearly tax. At that time died Nahor, son of Serug, in the 49th year of the life of Abram, son of Terah. And in the 50th year of the life of Abram's son of Terah, Abram came forth from the house of Noah and went to his father's house. And Abram knew Yahuwah, and he went in his ways and instructions, and Yahuwah his Elohim was with him. 
And Terah, his father, was in those days still captain of the host of the king of Nimrod, and he still followed strange Elohim. And Abram came to his father's house and saw twelve Elohim standing there in their temples. And the anger of Abram was kindled when he saw these images in his father's house. And Abram said, As Yahuwah lives, these images shall not remain in my father's house. So shall Yahuwah who created me do unto me, if in three days' time I do not break them all. And Abram went from them, and his anger burned within him. And Abram hastened and went forth from the chamber to his father's outer court. And he found his father sitting in the court, and all his servants with him. And Abram came and sat before him. And Abram asked his father, saying, Father, tell me, where is Elohim who created heaven and earth, and all the sons of men upon the earth, and who created you and me? And Terah answered his son Abram and said, Behold, those who created us are with us in the house. And Abram said to his father, My master, show them to me, I pray you. And Terah brought Abram into the chamber of the inner court. And Abram saw, and behold, the whole room was full of Elohim of wood and stone, twelve great images, others less than they without number. And Terah said to his son, Behold, these are they which made all that you see upon the earth, and which created me and you and all mankind. And Terah bowed down to his Elohim, and, and then he went away from them. And Abram his son went away with him. And when Abram had gone from them, he went to his mother and sat before her. And he said to his mother, Behold, my father has shown me those who made heaven and earth and all the sons of men. Now therefore hasten and fetch a kid from the flock and make it of savory meat, that I may bring it to my father's Elohim as an offering to them to eat. Perhaps I may thereby become acceptable to them. And his mother did so and fetched a kid and made savory meat thereof and brought it to Abram. And Abram took the savory meat from his mother and brought it before his father's Elohim. And he drew nigh to them that they might eat. And Terah, his father, did not know of it. And Abram saw on the day when he was sitting amongst them that they had no voice, no hearing, no motion, and not one of them could stretch forth his hand to eat. And Abram mocked them and said, Surely the savory meat that I have prepared has not pleased them, or perhaps it was too little for them, and for that reason they would not eat. Therefore, tomorrow I will prepare fresh savory meat, better and more plentiful than this, in order that I may see the result. And it was on the next day that Abram directed his mother concerning the savory meat. And his mother rose and fetched three fine kids from the flock, and she made them some excellent savory meat, such as her son was fond of. And she gave it to her son Abram, and Terah his father did not know of it. And Abram took the savory meat from his mother and brought it before his father's Elohim into the chamber. And he came nigh unto them that they might eat, and he placed it before them. And Abram sat before them all day, thinking perhaps they might eat. And Abram viewed them, and behold, they had neither voice nor hearing, nor did one of them stretch forth his hand to eat the meat. And in the evening of that day in the house, Abram was clothed with the spirit of Elohim. And he called out and said, Woe unto my father in this wicked generation, whose hearts are all inclined to vanity, who serve these idols of wood and stone, which can neither eat, smell, hear, nor speak, who have mouths without speech, eyes without sight, ears without hearing, hands without feeling, and legs that cannot move. Like them are those that made them and that trust in them. And when Abram saw all these things, his anger was kindled against his father. And he hastened and took a hatchet in his hand and came unto the chamber of the Elohim. And he broke all his father's Elohim. Hallelujah. And when he had done breaking the images, he placed the hatchet in the hand of the great Elohim, which was there before him. And he went out and Terah, his father, came home. For he had heard at the door the sound of the striking of the hatchet. So Terah came into the house to know what this was about. And Terah, having heard the noise of the hatchet in the room of the images, ran to the room to the images and met Abram going out. And Terah entered the room and found all the idols fallen down and broken, and the hatchet in the hand of the largest, which was not broken, and the savory meat which Abram and his son had made was still before them. And when Terah saw his anger was greatly kindled, he hastened and went from the room to Abram, and he found Abram his son sitting in the house, and he said to him, What is this work which you have done to my Elohim? And Abram answered Terah his father, and he said, Not so, not so, my master, for I brought savory meat before them. And when I came nigh to them with the meat that they might eat, they all at once stretched forth their hands to eat before the great one had put forth his hand to eat. And the large one saw their works that they did before him, and his anger was violently kindled against them. And he went and took the hatchet that was in the house and came to them and broke them all. And behold, the hatchet is yet in his hand, as you see. And Terah's anger was kindled against his son Abram and when he spoke this. And Terah said to Abram, his son, in his anger, What is this tale that you have told? You speak lies to me. Is there in these Elohim spirit, soul, or power to do all that you have told me? Are they not wood and stone, and have I not made them, myself made them? And can you speak such lies, saying that this large Elohim that was with him smote them? 
Is this that you did place? It is you that did place the hatchet in his hands, and then sayest he smote them all. And Abram answered his father and said to him, And how can you then serve these idols in whom there is no power to do anything? Can these idols in which you truest, in which you truest deliver you? Can they hear your prayers when you call upon them? Can they deliver you from the hands of your enemies? Or will they fight your battles against your enemies that you should serve wood and stone which can neither speak nor hear? And now surely it is not good for you nor for the sons of men that are connected with you to do these things. Are you so silly, so foolish, or so short of understanding that you will serve wood and stone and do after this manner? And forget Yahweh Elohim who made heaven and earth and who created you in the earth and thereby bring a great evil upon your souls in this matter by serving stone and wood? Did not our fathers in days of old sin in this matter? And Yahweh Elohim of the universe brought forth, brought the waters of the flood upon them and destroyed the whole earth? And how can you continue to do this and serve Elohim of wood and stone who cannot hear or speak or deliver you from oppression, thereby bringing down the anger of Elohim of the universe upon you? Now therefore, my father, refrain from this and bring not evil upon your soul and the souls of your household. And Abram hastened and sprang from his, before his father and took the hatchet from his father's largest idol with which Abraham broke it and ran away. And Terah, seeing all that Abraham had done, hastened to go from his house and he went to the king and he came before Nimrod and stood before him. And he bowed down to the king and the king said to him, What do you want? And he said, I beseech thee, my master, to hear me. Now fifty years back a child was born to me and thus has he done to my Elohim. And thus has he spoken, and now therefore my master and king, send for him that he may come before you and judge him according to your law, that we may be delivered from his evil. And the king sent three men of his servants, and they went and brought Abram before the king. And Nimrod and all his princes and servants were that day sitting before him, and Terah sat also before them. And the king said to Abram, What is this that you have done to your father and to his Elohim? And Abram answered the king in the words that he spoke to his father, and he said, The large Elohim that was with them in the house, did to them what you have heard. And the king answered to Abram, Have they any power to speak and to eat and do as you have said? And Abram answered the king, saying, And if there be no power in them, why do you serve them and cause the sons of men to err through thy follies? Do you imagine that they can deliver you or do anything small or great that you should serve them? And why will you not sense the Elohim of the whole universe who created you and in whose power it is to kill and keep alive? O oh, foolish, simple, and ignorant king, woe unto you forever. Can you imagine saying that before Nimrod? Wow. I thought that you would teach your servants the upright way, but you have not done this, but has filled the whole earth with thy sins and the sins of thy people who have followed thy ways. Do you not know, or have you not heard, that this evil which you do, our ancestors, sinned therein in days of old, and the eternal Elohim brought the waters of the flood upon them, and destroyed them all, and also destroyed the whole earth on their account? And will you and your people rise up now and do like this work, in order to bring down the anger of Yahweh Elohim of the universe, and to bring evil upon you and the whole earth? Now therefore... Put away this evil deed which you do and serve the Elohim of the universe as so, as your soul is in his hands and then it will be well with you. And if your wicked heart will not hearken to my words to cause you to forsake thy evil ways and to serve the eternal Elohim, then you will die in shame and in your latter days you and your people and all who are connected with you hearing thy words or walking in thy evil ways. And when Abram had ceased speaking before the king and his princes, Abram lifted his eyes to heavens and said, Yahweh sees all the wicked and he will judge them. So here, you know, in the scriptures, we'll, we'll see um, that, you know, Abraham is called a prophet. And we don't get a whole lot of that um, in, the, in the, uh, the canon. We get some prophecies, but uh, here we see him acting as a, as, a, as a true prophet. Chapter 12. And when the king heard the words of Abram, he ordered him to be put into prison. And Abram was ten days in prison. Remember that passage in um, Revelation, right? The devil will put you into prison ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. At the end of those days, the king ordered that all the kings, the princes, the governors, the different provinces, and the sages should come before him. And they sat before him. And Abram was still in the house of confinement. And the king said to the princes and sages, Have you heard what Abram, the son of Terah, has done to his father? Thus has he done to him, and I ordered him to be brought before me, and thus has he spoken. His heart did, mis did not misgive him, neither did he stir in my presence. And behold, now he is confined in the prison. Right? So he's like, he wasn't even scared. He wasn't even scared in my presence. And therefore decide what judgment is due to this man who reviled the king, who spoke and did all the things that you have heard. And they all answered the king, saying, The man who reviles the king should be hanged upon a tree. But having done all the things that he said, 
And having despised our Elohim, he must therefore be burned to death, for this is the law in this manner. If it pleases the king to do this, let him order his servants to kindle a fire both night and day in thy brick furnace, and then we will cast this man into it. This is starting to sound familiar. And the king did so, and he commanded his servants that they should prepare a fire for three days and three nights in the king's furnace, that is in Kazdim, Ur of the Kazdim. And the king ordered them to take Abram from prison and to bring him out to be burned. And all the king's servants, the princes, the masters, the governors and judges, and all the inhabitants of the land, about 900,000 men stood opposite the furnace to see Abram. And all the women and little ones crowded upon the roofs and towers to see what was doing with Abram. And they all stood together at a distance. And there was not a man left that did not come on that day to behold the scene. So imagine that. Almost a million people was watching. And when Abram was come, the conjurers of the king and the sages saw Abram. And they cried out to the king saying, Our sovereign master, surely this is the man whom we knew to have been with child. Been the child at whose birth the great star swallowed up the four stars, which we declared to the king now fifty years since. And behold, now his father has also transgressed your commandments and mocked thee by bringing thee another child, which you did kill. Uh, just a little context. Long story short, um, wise men of Nimrod's wise men saw uh, a sign in the heavens. That night Abraham was born. They knew that what the sign meant that Abraham was going to destroy Nimrod's kingdom. They told Nimrod. Nimrod told Terah, hey, bring me Abram so I can kill him. Terah was like waffling. Uh, so another son was born to him in that night from one of his handmaidens. So he took that kid instead. Uh, Nimrod killed him and the whole thing was kind of squashed until now. So now Nimrod just found out that Terah tricked him. Right, so now Terah is in hot water. And when the king heard the words, he was exceedingly wroth, and he ordered Terah to be brought before him. And the king said, Have you heard what the conjurers have spoken? Now tell me truly, how did you, and if you shall speak truth, you shall be acquitted. And seeing that the king's anger was so much kindled, Terah said to the king, My master and king, you have heard the truth, and what the sages have spoken is right. And the king said, How could you do this thing to transgress my orders and to give me a child that you did not beget and to take value for him? And Terah answered the king, because my tender feelings were excited for my son at that time, and I took a son of my handmaid, and I brought him to the king. And the king said, Who advised you of this? Tell me, do not hide aught from me, and then you shall not die. And Terah was greatly terrified in the king's presence, and he said to the king, It was Haran, my eldest son, who advised me to this. And Haran was in those days that oh, I'm sorry, and Haran was in those days that Abraham was born two and thirty years old. But Haran did not advise his father to anything. For Terah said this to the king in order to deliver his soul from the king, for he feared greatly. And the king said to Terah, Haran, thy son who advised thee to do this shall die through fire with Abraham. For the sentence of death is upon him for having rebelled against the king's desire in doing this thing. And Haran at that time felt inclined to follow the ways of Abraham, but he kept it within himself. And Haran said it within his heart, Behold, now the king has seized Abraham on account of these things which Abraham did. And it shall come to pass that if Abram prevail over the king, that I will follow him. But if the king prevail, I will go after the king. So he was double-minded. He was double-hearted, right? Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And when Terah had spoken this to the king concerning Haran, his son, the king ordered Haran to be seized with Abram. And they brought them both, Abram and his Haran, his brother, to cast them into the fire. And all the inhabitants of the land, remember about a million people almost, of the land and the king's servants and the princes and all the women and the little ones were there standing that day over them. And the king's servants took Abram and his brother and they stripped them of all their clothes excepting their lower garments which were upon them. And they bound their hands and feet with linen cords. And the servants of the king lifted them up and cast them both into the furnace. And Yahweh loved Abram and he had compassion over him. And Yahweh came down and delivered Abram from the fire and he was not burned. But all the cords with which they bound him were burned, while Abram remained and walked about in the fire. And Haran died when they cast him into the fire, and he was burned to ashes, for his heart was not perfect with Yahuwah. And those men who cast him into the fire, the flame of the fire spread over them, and they were burned, and twelve men of them died. And Abram walked in the midst of the fire three days and three nights. All the servants of the king saw him walking in the fire, and they came and told the king, saying, Behold, we have seen Abram walking about in the midst of the fire, and even the lower garments which are upon him are not burned, but the cord with which he was bound is burned. And when the king heard their words, his heart fainted, and he would not believe them. So he sent other faithful princes to see this matter, and they went and saw it. <clears throat> 
and told it to the king. And the king rose to go and see it. And he saw Abram walking to and fro in the midst of the fire. And he saw Haran's body burned, and the king wondered greatly. And the king ordered Abram to be taken out from the fire. And his servants approached to take him out, and they could not, for the fire was round about, and the flame ascending tore them from the furnace. And the king's servants fled from it. And the king rebuked them, saying, Make haste and bring Abram out of the fire, that you should not die. <clears throat> And the servants of the king again approached to bring Abram out. And the flames came upon them and burned their faces, so that eight of them died. And when the king saw that his servants could not approach the fire, lest they should be burned, the king called to Abram, O servant of Elohim who is in the heaven, go forth from amidst the fire and come hither before me. And Abram hearkened to the voice of the king. And he went forth from the fire and came and stood before the king. And when Abram came out, the king and all his servants saw Abram coming before the king with his lower garments upon him, for they were not burned, but the cord with which he was bound was burned. And the king said to Abram, How is it that you were not burned in the fire? And Abram said to the king, The Elohim of heaven and earth, in, wisdom, in whom I trust, and whom has all his power, he delivered me from the fire in which you did cast me. And Haran thy brother of Abram was burned to ashes, and they sought for his body, and they found it consumed. And Haran was 82 years old when he died in the fire of Kazdim. And the king, the princes, the inhabitants of the land, seeing that Abram was delivered from the fire, they came and bowed down to Abram. And Abram said to them, Do not bow down to me, but bow down to the Elohim of the world who made you, and serve him, and go in his ways, for it is he who delivered me from out of this fire. And it is he who created the souls and spirits of all men, and formed man in his mother's womb, and brought him forth into the world. And it is he who will deliver those who trust in him from all pain. And this thing seemed very wonderful in the eyes of the king and princes that Abram was saved from the fire and the Haran was burned. And the king gave Abram many presents and he gave him his two head servants from the king's house. The name of the one is Onai and the name of the other was Eleazar. And all the kings and princes and servants gave Abram many gifts of silver and gold and pearl. And the king and his princes sent him away and he went in peace. And Abram went forth from the king in peace and many of the king's servants followed him. About three hundred men joined him. And Abram returned on that day and went to his father's house, he and the men that followed him. And Abram served Yahweh his Elohim all the days of his life, and he walked in the ways and followed his Torah. And from that day forward, Abram inclined the hearts of the sons of men to serve Yahweh. So he preached the good news, right? And that's part of this order of Melchizedek, uh, which we're going to be talking quite a bit about. Maybe not as much this, uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about it in this Torah portion, but moving forward. And that time, Nahor, the son of Abram, took unto themselves wives, the daughter of, his, of their brother Haran. The wife of Nahor was Milcah, and the name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And Sarai, the wife of Abram, was barren, and she had no offspring in those days. Um, yeah, anyways, so it keeps going. So the story continues, but we'll stop there for now. Uh, just wanted to give you some context of what he went through. Because when we meet him, it's literally all that stuff's already happened. And it's just like, hey, come on out. Uh, so I wanted to give you a little backstory about Avram and his faith and, and what uh, he's into or he's been into. So um, let's look at the, um, let's see. Hang on. Here we go. This is the Targums. This is chapter 11. This is from last week's, but it confirms the same story. These are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. And it was when Nimrod had cast Abram into the furnace of fire because he would not worship his idol. And the fire had no power to burn him. That Haran's heart became doubtful, saying, If Nimrod overcome, I will be on his side. But if Abram overcome, I will be on his side. And when all the people who were there saw that the fire had no power over, over Abram, they said in their hearts, Is not Haran the brother of Abram full of divinations and charms? And has he not utter, uttered spells over the fire that it should not burn his brother? Immediately there fell fire from the heavens and consumed him. And Haran died in the sight of Terah, his father, where he was burned in the land of his nativity in the furnace of fire, which the Kazdim had made for Abram, his brother. So a little difference of the story, but the overall story is the same. And so that's our con kind of confirming witness there. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, let's keep going. So, and Yahuwah, so Genesis 12, 7, and Yahuwah appeared unto El Avram and said, Unto your seed will I give this land, and there be a an altar unto Yahuwah who appeared unto him. 
And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Beit El, and pitched his tent, having Beit El on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto Yahuwah, and called upon the name of Yahuwah. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the Negev, the desert. And there was a famine in the land, and Avram went down into Mitzrayim to sojourn there, for the famine was very grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Mitzrayim, he said unto El Sarai his woman, Behold now, I know that you are a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Mitzrayim shall see you, that they shall say, This is his woman, and they will kill me, but they will save you alive. Say, I pray you, that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and my soul shall live because of you. And it came to pass that when Avram was coming to Mitzrayim, the Mitzrayim beheld the woman that she was very fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Avram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And Yahweh plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Avram's woman. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done unto me? Why did you not tell me that she was your woman? Why said you, She is my sister, so I might have taken her to me be my woman? Now therefore, behold, your woman, take her and go your way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his woman and all that he had. Uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, in the book of Yashar, chapter 67 16 through 30, you have uh, the story being retold to Pharaoh, and you know, hundreds of years later, that were oppressing uh, the children of Israel. Uh, he was reminded of the story by Jethro, Ruel, uh, Moses' eventual father in law. He retold this story. He was like, Pharaoh, don't you know when Abraham, their father, came down and took, you know, took Sarai and they were plagued and whatnot? So, hey, be careful, be careful with these people. Uh, you know, a book that I've gotten into this last year is called The Writings of Abraham. Um, test it for yourself. I believe this book is legitimate. It's true. A lot of people mistake this for the book of Abraham, which is in the, the Book of Mormon. This is not the same book. It's a completely different book. Uh, I don't believe that, that book's true, but I believe this book is true. Uh, this is a different uh, papyrus that was found in 1831 in Egypt. Anyways, we get a little extra bit of the story here, and it's kind of interesting of how this all went down. Get a little more details. I'm in a place in my walk where I want all the details. I want to know everything when it comes to uh, his word, especially the Torah, especially uh, someone like a patriarch, like a patriarch like Abraham. Um, there are so many details left out of uh, the, the, how he walked, the priesthood he, the, the in the Melchizedek priesthood he walked in, um, what they called the Order of the Ancients. Just amazing. So, uh, writings of Abraham, uh, chapter sixty. If you if you read. If you're going to read it in the book that uh, Zen put out, uh, everything's one chapter later. So this is, starts in 61 in that book. But on the night before I entered Egypt, I dreamed a dream. And behold, in my dream, I saw a cedar and a palm tree. And the branches of the palm tree were wrapped around the cedar. Suddenly, a group of men approached, seeing, seeking to cut down the cedar and to leave the palm tree to stand alone. But the palm tree cried out, saying, Cut not down the cedar, for whosoever seeks to fell it shall find the curse of Elohim resting upon him. So the men desisted, and the cedar was spared by the act of the palm tree. 61. When the dream was ended, I awoke from my sleep and wondered at it. Wherefore, I went before Yahuwah in prayer and besought him, saying, O Yahuwah, show me the interpretation of this dream which I have had this night. And Yahuwah said unto me, Behold, Sarai thy wife is a beautiful woman to look upon above all the women of the earth. Therefore, it shall come to pass that when the Egyptians shall see her, they will say, She is his wife, and they will seek to slay thee for, thy, for the sake of obtaining thy wife. Let Sarai thy wife therefore say unto them, He is my kinsman, and your soul shall live. So this came from Yah, or Yahusha, essentially. For you are the cedar, or Abraham, or Abraham, and Sarai is the palm tree, and this is the interpretation of the dream. For through the act of thy wife you shall be saved, and the way will be opened for thee to preach the mysteries of the godliness in the court of Pharaoh. So all this happened for a reason, so that he can preach the good news. We don't get any of this in the canon. Uh, so, so yeah, so the way will be open to preach the mysteries of godliness in the court of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. For these Egyptians are thy kindred of thy seed of Eber, and it is my will that the truths of the everlasting gospel shall be brought to them. 62. 
Now I heard, I had heard while I dwelt in Haran that some of the seed of Eber had entered into Egypt and driven the seed of Ham to the south and taken possession of the land. But these followed not after Elohim of their father Eber, but worshipped the idol Elohim, even as did my father Terah. But they followed not after the abominations of Nimrod. Now these Hebrews were of the seed of Hadoram, the son of Joktan, the son of Eber. And Joktan was the brother of Peleg. And Eber was the son of Selah, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem. Wherefore, Yahweh had sent to me to preach the gospel unto these who had departed from the Elohim of their fathers. 63. Wherefore, I awakened my wife Sarai and said unto her, I have had a dream from Yahweh. Tell it to me, she said, that I may know what it is. Therefore, I related unto her the dream and all that Yahweh had said to me concerning it. And I added, when the men of the land shall inquire of you, saying, who is this who accomplishes you? Say simply unto them, he is my kinsman. Thus shall my soul live and Yahweh will use their love for you as a means whereby the gospel shall be preached among them. Fear not to do this thing, for they will neither defile you, contrary to your covenants, nor slay me, but all shall come to pass to the glory of our Elohim. 64. Sarai, my wife, was fearful when she heard the danger through which we must pass, and wept that night before Yahweh. But she placed her trust in him, and was comforted by his Ruach HaKodesh. The next day we moved on across the seven branches of the river, and proceeded towards phone where pharaoh dwelt but i kept sarai hidden until we reached phone for it was in the home of pharaoh that yahweh that yahweh purposed to her great beauty to open the heart of pharaoh unto the work of elohim when we reached the city of phone three of pharaoh's officers met us and i brought sarai forth to sit at my right hand while i gave them audience according to the word of yahweh while i attempted to explain unto them our having there come because of the famine in the land of canaan and that we sojourn among them, they kept bestowing compliments upon Sarai for her great beauty and wisdom and the luster of her countenance. 65. When the men departed from me, they went directly into the presence of Pharaoh, and when they had eaten with him, and he had good wine brought forth, while they drank together, they began to speak unto him what had, had transpired. But they could not. But they all could speak. But all they could speak were the beauties of Sarai. How beautiful is the woman Sarai, they said, who sits at Abram's right hand. How comely is the shape of her face. How delicate and fine spun are her tresses. How beautiful are her eyes. How delicate is her nose and the whole luster of her countenance. How fair are her breasts and how comely with all is her complexion. How comely too are her arms and how perfect her hands. How pleasing are her hands to behold. How lovely her palms and her slender her fingers. How comely are her feet. How well rounded her thighs. None of the maidens and none of the brides that enter the bride chamber are fairer than she. Her beauty is greater than all other women, and she excels them all. Moreover, along with all this beauty, she has great wisdom, and the workmanship of her hands is fair indeed. 66. When he heard these words, Pharaoh lusted after Sarai, and he sent his servants to fetch her to him. Knowing it to be the will of Yahuwah, I let her go, although my heart was greed within me. When Pharaoh saw her, his lust grew within him, for he was overcome by her beauty, and he took her into her his household as his wife, and sent men to slay me, that I might not rise up to claim her. But Sarai, seeing these things, said unto Pharaoh, He is but my kinsman. Wherefore, Pharaoh called back his men, and my life was spared. 67. But Lot and I and our household spent that night in prayer before Yahuwah for Sarai, that she might accomplish her mission, and that she might not be defiled contrary to her covenants. And I stood with mine arms stretched out toward heaven after the holy order of Elohim. And I said, Blessed are you, O Yahuwah, the Most High Elohim, Yahuwah of the worlds, and Yahuwah, and ruler over all things. I know that you do rule over all the kings of the earth, executing judgment upon them in righteousness, even as you did save me from the evil designs of the mighty king Nimrod. Now do I come, and by the way, in this book too, the same thing happened with the furnace of fire. So three witnesses. Now do I complain before you concerning Pharaoh of Phon, king of Egypt, who has violently abducted Sarai, my wife Sarai from me. Wreak justice upon him in my behalf, and let me behold thine hand wax mightily against him and against all his household, and let him not be able to, this night to defile my wife contrary to her covenants. Let them come to know, O Yahuwah, that you art Yahuwah of the kings of the earth and the ruler of all men, for this cause that I suffer Sarai to go among them according to thy counsel. 68. And Elohim hearkened unto my prayer and withheld his spirit from the Egyptians that none of them were able to come with their wives that night. In the morning, consternation reigned throughout the land of Egypt, for no man had been able to lie with his wife at all that night. And Pharaoh also was greatly perplexed, for although his lust towards Sarai had grown throughout that night, he had been unable to satisfy that lust because of the curse of Elohim which rested upon him.
Therefore, he summoned all his wise men and the physicians of his household, but none could heal him, and all had suffered the same affliction. 69. Then the spirit of Yahuwah fell upon Sarai, and she said, My Aaron, it is indeed a sad matter that this affection has should be upon you. My kinsman Abram is a man full of wisdom and the spirit of our Elohim. Send for him, therefore, and he shall tell you how to be delivered from these bonds, that you may be freely take, your, take me to yourself. Now this he said at the direction of Yahuwah Elohim, and Yahuwah softened Pharaoh's heart, that the hearkened under that he hearkened under her words and sent Shalom, one of his chief ministers, unto my camp. Seventy. When Shalom arrived in the camp, he was, according to my directions, led to the tent of Lot. And when he had entered the tent, he bowed before Lot and said, My master Pharaoh and all the males of the land of Egypt have been cursed that they are unable to come with their wives. But it has been told Pharaoh by his handmaiden Sarai that her kinsman Abram is a man full of wisdom and of the spirit of your Elohim. Let him therefore come and lay his hands upon my master Pharaoh and pray for him that he may be healed and live. But Yahweh said to him, As long as Sarai... His wife Sarai remains with the king. My uncle Abram will not be able to pray for him. Be you off and tell the king to release the woman to her husband. Then he will pray for him and he will be healed. 71. When Shalom heard these words, he was amazed and he went straight to the king. My master, king, he said, the curse has come on account of Sarai, the wife of Abram. Let Sarai but be, be but restored to her husband Abram, and this curse will be lifted from off all the males of Egypt. Upon hearing these words, the king asked Sarai, saying, Is this thing so? Yea, my master, she replied, and it is done that you might behold the power of Elohim. For when your heart lusted after me, you should have asked and not taken me by force. But this is done that the glory of Elohim might be revealed, that you should turn from the worship of dumb idols to the worship of the true and living Elohim. So there's a purpose. That's why I want to read this. There's a whole purpose to the story. It's kind of just out of nowhere. It's just like, okay, his wife was taken from him and, you know, she was given back. But there's a whole purpose behind this. So, <clears throat> 72. Hearing these words, Pharaoh summoned me to him. And when I entered his presence, he asked, what is this thing that has been done? For I have taken Sarai to wife while she was yet your wife. And for this thing, a curse has fallen upon me and all the males in the land of Egypt. <clears throat> Therefore, pray for me that this curse may be removed from us. According to Pharaoh's request, I laid my hands upon him and prayed over him. And he and all the males of Egypt were healed. Right? That's some, that's some Book of Acts stuff, right? Laying on the hands. That's walking in the Melchizedek priesthood. 73. When the king had been blessed, he was... He was that he recovered, and he praised Yahuwah for his recovery. Wherefore, I took him into the garden and baptized him in the name of Yahuwah and all his household with him. And when I had blessed him again, Sarai came before him, and he knew that he had been healed for the spirit of Elohim fall upon him with his testimony, and the witness thereof was sure. Then, 74, then Pharaoh arose and praised Yahuwah and proclaimed to all his people that they should worship the most high Elohim who had healed them. And he desired to enter into a covenant of eternal brotherhood with me, that I should be his father and he should be my son. Wherefore said unto Pharaoh, Put forth your hand upon my thigh, and I will make you swear before Yahuwah, the Elohim of heaven and earth, that you should be true to me and your heirs to mine forever. And I shall receive you unto myself to be my son and brother, to inherit all the blessings of mine house and to bear my priesthood forever. Wherefore Pharaoh put his hand upon my thigh and swore to me according to this oath. And when he had sworn, Lot sealed him mine that he should be my son in the time of eternity, and Pharaoh rejoiced therein. All right, last one, 75. And the king clothed me in his own robes and seated me upon his throne, placing his own crown upon my head and scepter in my hand. And I did teach him and his people all the mysteries of godliness from first to last. For Pharaoh did introduce me to the temple which had been built by the fathers, commenced by Father Seth and completed by Father Shem. Some people will speculate this is the pyramids. After the great flood, and therein I did officiate the rites and ordinances of the house of Yahuwah. Which, if it's true, lends more credibility that New Jerusalem is actually a pyramid and not a square or a dome. And Pharaoh made all matters right with Sarai, and he blessed her with outpouring of his spirit, and she was blessed in his presence. And he gave unto her Hagar, his own daughter, so Hagar was a, an Egyptian, we know that, also to be her companion, and to Hagar he gave many gifts. And I was seven years in the land of Egypt, teaching the gospel and administering unto Pharaoh and his household and all the Egyptians the blessings, the rites, ordinances of the gospel with the power thereof. 
And I established among them the order of the fathers and the order and the priesthood thereof until the name of Yahuwah was glorified throughout the land of Egypt. And I taught the people the nature of the heavens and of the earth and the plan of salvation and the blessings of Yahuwah unto those who serve him in purity of heart and to believe on the Son of Elohim who should come and make atonement for their sins. Awesome. And so great was the power of Elohim among us in that time of all the Egyptians had turned from their idolatry to the worship of the true Elohim, and I and my people had cause to rejoice in the fruits of the labors. This is what it looked like in Yahushua's time, in the Acts church time, and this is what we're supposed to do, right? Going in the midst of Egypt, preaching the good news, and bringing people out of idolatry and false worship and paganism and unbelief into the true service of our Elohim. Praise Yah. All right, chapter 13, let's see, is this going to be, this is going to be a long one. We're an hour into it, and we're only one chapter into it, so we may have to just do half of this, and we'll do the other half uh, another, we'll, we'll see where we're at, we'll see where we're at when we're about halfway through this. Okay, chapter 13. And Abraham went up out of Mitzrayim, and he and his woman and all that he had, and lot with him, lot with him into the Negev. The Negev is the desert, right? So he comes out of Egypt, comes out of Babylon, comes out of Egypt, and goes into the wilderness, the desert. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, that's what we're doing. We're coming out of her, we're coming out of Babylon. Uh, I think a lot of us know, especially those of us that live in America, that this is end times Egypt. We're coming out of Egypt into the desert, right? And Avram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. A lot of parallels here. Exodus 12, 35. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moshe, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And Yahuwah gave the people a favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot, besides men and children. And a mixed multitude also went up with them, and flocks and herds, and very much cattle. So they came out of Egypt rich. Abraham came out of Egypt rich rich in the end times when we come out of egypt physically rich spiritually we're coming out of egypt being rich with wisdom right so all you gotta do is read a little bit of proverbs 2 and um right if you cry for knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding if you seek her as silver and search for her as, as the hid treasures then you shall understand the fear of yahweh and find the knowledge of elohim um anyways this is this is the true riches this is the true riches of Elohim. So in a spiritual sense, we're coming out of Egypt and being richly rewarded with the fruits of the Torah, with the understanding of the Torah. This is the true gift in our day. Praise Yah. Okay. Verse 3. And he went on his journeys from the Negev into Beit El unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Beit El and Ai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of Yahuwah. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray you, between me and you, and brethren, my herdsmen and your herdsmen. And I'm sorry, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I pray you, from me. If you will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. The Targum reads on that one. Uh, this is the Aramaic Targums. And contentions arose between the shepherds of Abram's flock and the shepherds of the flock of Lot. For the shepherds of Abram had been instructed by him not to go among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, who as yet had power in the land, and to restrain the cattle that they should make no depredation. So... Just some extra context there. All right, verse 10, Genesis thirteen ten, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the circle of the Yardan, that it was well watered everywhere, before Yahuwah destroyed Sodom and Amorah, even as the garden of Yahuwah, like the land of Mitzrayim, as you come unto Zoar. So Sodom it used to be like the Garden of Edom. Uh, the Targum says the exact same. The land was plenteous, and this is then what happened Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, 
fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor the needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. 13.11 Then Lot chose him all the circle of the Ardan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of the Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the circle of the Yardan, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before Yahuwah exceedingly. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the separation. So the writings of Abraham, the separation is a little different. We're going to go to chapter 80. Now, after our depart, this is the writings of Abraham. Now, after our departure from Egypt, a faction arose among our people upon seeing the great wealth which Pharaoh had entrusted to us, for they desired property which they can call their own. And Lot also was among them, in which, but by the way, in this in this book, it's Abraham lived communally with with people. Right? They held all things common. They all had stuff. Like they, each person had a tent, and they had stuff. Right? So it's not, you know, uh, so they they had stuff, but everything was shared, you know, communally. Lot also was among them of this faction that wanted to separate and have their own stuff. Which the thing grieved me greatly, but seeing that they would not be reconciled, we gave unto them a portion of the common property, and they departed from us under Lot's direction and settled in the valley of the Jordan River. There they went from place to place as their flocks needed pasture until they reached the city of Sodom, where they mingled with the inhabitants and became one with them. Lot also built a house in Sodom, Sodom and settled there. But all the company that went out from us only Lot maintained his integrity and did not violate the covenants of his priesthood, nor bow to the heathen idol Elohim. Nevertheless, Lot did not walk perfectly in the way of the fathers, for he dwelt not among the people of Elohim, but built his own house, and he coveted his own property, that he should govern it rather than holding all things common with the saints. This is a big thread uh, topic that we're going to be talking about in the future. This is the next step. Nevertheless, Lot did continue to serve Yahuwah, and Yahuwah loved him and his family, and his property grew very large. But I was grieved in my heart that Lot had parted from me, for I, for he had stood at my right hand and had been instructed in a better way. And then uh, in the book of Yashar, because we read that the the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before Yahuwah exceedingly. Let's, let's read a little bit about that. This is just a small snippet of some of the garbage they did. Um, if you have children, young children, and you don't want them to hear um, something explicit uh, in a uh, fornicating matter, I would uh, go and excuse them from the room for just two minutes, three minutes. This is Yashar eighteen eleven through 15. In those days, all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of the whole five cities were exceedingly wicked and sinful against Yahuwah, and they provoked Yahuwah with their abominations, and they strengthened in aging abominably and scornfully before Yahuwah. And their wickedness and crimes were in those days great before Yahuwah. And they had in their land a very extensive valley, about half a day's walk, and in it there were fountains of water and a great deal of herbage surrounding the water. And all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah went there four times in the year with their wives and children and all belonging to them. And they rejoiced there with timbrels and dances. And in the time of rejoicing, they would all rise and lay hold of their neighbor's wives and some the virgin daughters of their neighbors, and they enjoyed them. And each man saw his wife and his daughter in the hands of his neighbor and did not say a word. And they did so from morning to night, and they afterward returned home, each man to his house and each woman to her tent. And so they always did four times in the year. So it's just it's just like a mishmash of people and babies and fornicating and how twisted, like how twisted. So sexual sins seem to be some of the worst, right? And that's what we're seeing in our day and age. We're seeing Sodom and Gomorrah all over again. People are into all this kind of stuff, you know? It's not even, it's not even about um, men with men or women with women, but it's like, you know, people changing their, trying to change their gender and all kinds of confusion, just total confusion. And uh, we we ha we must be in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. <clears throat> the Targums read, and the men of so uh, Sodom were depraved in their wealth, one with another, and they sinned in their bodies, and they sinned with open nakedness and the shedding of innocent blood, and practiced strange worship and rebelled greatly against the name of Yahuwah. We're also going to read Yashar thirteen, one through four. Uh, no, not yet. What is this?
Okay, yeah, all right. Verse 14. And Yahweh said unto Avram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now your eyes, and look from that place where you are northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, to you will I give it, and to your seed forever. Praise ya. So why did I have Jasher? Oh, it's because I had the wrong one. Okay, Jasher 13. Yeah. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and the son of Haran and his Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and the wife of his son Abram. And all the souls of his household went to Ur the Kazdim to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came as far as the land of Haran, they remained there, for it was exceedingly good pasture for pasture, and a sufficient extent for those who accompanied them. And the people of the land of Haran saw that Abram was good and upright with Elohim and men, and that uh, Yahuwah his Elohim was with them. And some of the people of the land of Haran came and joined Abram. And he taught them the instruction of Yahuwah and his ways, and these men remained with Abram in his house, and they adhered to him. So again, Abram going out and preaching the good news, and people you know, coming out of idolatry and coming back to the true worship. What a great, you know, what, what a great you know, picture for what we're supposed to be doing. And I have a feeling that the apostles, after Yahushua arose, they had this book, and they learned about how to walk in communal lifestyle and preaching the good news all around the country, all around the world. And Abram remained in the land three years, and at the expiration of three years, Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said, I am Yahuwah who brought you forth from Ur of the Kazdim and delivered you from the hands of all your enemies. Now therefore, if you will hearken to my voice and keep my commandments and my statutes and my Torah, then I will cause your enemies to fall before you, and I will multiply your seed like the stars of heaven, and I will send my blessing upon all the works of my hands, and you shall lack nothing. Right? So here, right? Look at this whole land. What you see is going to be yours. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall your seed also be numbered. Arise, walk you through the land and the strength of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto you. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto Yahuwah. So, this is the land, right? The land of Canaan is where the regathering is going to happen. A lot of people are speculating, like, well, America is you know, the most fruitful land. It only makes sense that this would be the land of inheritance. You know, although if that's not the case, if if that land over there, the land of Canaan, isn't the case, then that you know that scripture is is you know null and void. Zechariah twelve one through six: The burden of the word of Yahuwah for Israel, saith Yahuwah, which stretcheth forth the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem. I believe this is New Jerusalem, a cup of trembling unto all the people around about, when they shall be in the siege both against Yehuda and against Jerusalem. And that day will I make Yerushalayim a burdensome stone for all the people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. We learn in 2 Ezra 13 that it is New Jerusalem that all the people of the earth gather themselves against. And that day, says Yahuwah, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Yehuda, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Yehuda shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Yerushalayim shall be my strength, and Yahuwah Sebaot, their Elohim. In that day, I will make the governors of Yehuda like an hearth of fire among the wood, like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about. Two witnesses, right? And on the right hand and on the left hand, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. So this is saying New Jerusalem is going to be in her own place, even in Jerusalem, right? So it's kind of hidden there. Just kind of popping ahead a little bit later in this portion, seven, Genesis 17. And I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land where you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their Elohim. So it's forever. So I do believe that this is where New Jerusalem is going to set down. We'll look at the borders a little bit later. All right, writings of Abraham 82. One night Elohim appeared to me in a vision and said, Go up to the top of Chazor and lift up thine eyes and gaze eastward and westward and southward and northward and behold all this land. For behold unto you and to your seed after you shall I give it for an everlasting inheritance. The next day I ascended Chazor, as Yahuwah commanded me, and I gazed upon all the land from the river of Egypt unto Lebanon, Shanir, from the great sea unto Haran, the whole area of Seir as far as Kadesh, the whole great wilderness which lies east of Haran, and the region of Shanir as far as the Euphrates. 
And as I beheld the land, Yahweh my Elohim spake in my heart, saying, Blessed Abraham, I have chosen you to stand at the head of a multitude. Wherefore, unto you and to thy seed after you, I will give this land, and all that your eye beholds, that you may possess it forever. And I shall multiply thy seed like the dust of the earth, for even as no man can count the dust of the earth, so shall thy seed be without number. Rise up now, encompass this land. Behold the length of it, and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto you and to your seed after you forever. Praise ya. All right. Oops. Uh, we finished that, right? So yeah, arise, walk through the land, the length of it, the breadth of it, for I will give it unto you. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto Yahuwah. All right. So how are we doing on time? All right, maybe, maybe we can finish. Ah, oh, there's still so much to go over. I don't want to rush this. Yeah, maybe we'll just do two parts for this one. The first three weeks of Torah portions are so amazing and so large. All right, chapter 14. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of El Elisar, Keder Leomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Birsha, king of Amora, and Shinab, king of Adma, and Shem Eber, king of Tseboim, and the king of Bela, which is Tsoar. All these were joined together in the valley of Sidim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Keder Leomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Keder Leomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim and the Zuzim in Ham and the Emim in Shaveh Kiriath Aim and the Chorim in Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And these are, these are, this is the slayings of the giants. So these wars were probably just massive wars like in my old life i watched movies like the lord of the rings and stuff like that and i can only imagine that this is these battles were like that but even like more epic epic battles just smoting all the giants i mean these giants are just towering and whew. verse seven and they returned and came to in mishpat which is kadesh and smote all the country of the amalekim and also the Emorim that dwelt in Chatzron Tamar. And there went out of the king of Sodom, and the king of Amorah, the king of Adma, and the king of Tseboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Soar. And they joined battle with him in the valley of Sedim, with Keder Leomer, king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the valley of Sidim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Amorah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Amorah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And there came one that escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, the Ivri, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Emirate and brother of Eshkol, and brother of Aner, and these were confederates with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken, taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Chobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the, and the woman also and the people. Praise Yah. Right? So just think about the power that Yah gave Abram here that, uh, you know, 318 men against five entire armies. I, what text was it that had numbers? Maybe it was Yashar. Taught, I, didn't, I don't have that reference up today, but I think... It was like half a million or 700,000. It was just 318. Again. It was just a crazy number like that. Don't quote me on that. But it was just a crazy number like that. And it's like, where does that even come from? It comes from, yeah. I've been reading the book of Gad the Seer a lot lately, which is mentioned in the book of Chronicles, that um, David had made a, made a statement, you know, praising Yah. He's like, who killed the lion? 
Who delivered me from the hand of the, of the paw of the bear? Who killed the Philistine? Who delivered me from every battle? Not me. And he gave praise to Yah. And it said, it responded, it said Yah was very pleased with his heart. So, same thing happened here happened with Abram, of course. He gave Abram just superpowers, right? To do these things. The Ruach was with him. Remember, like Levi and Simeon going into Shechem and killing thousands, just them two. Can he do the same with us? Can he do the same with us? Yes, he can. Absolutely, he can. And he will. Uh, 1417. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedar Leomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shabbat, which is the king's valley. And let me just say this, as far as what he can do with this, he can do it in both a physical sense, because I do believe that one day uh, that Yahusha will take his 144,000 in great multitude, and you know those 144,000 will be his army. Um, but in a spiritual sense, you know, doing battle in the spiritual realm, he's given us that victory. We, we can slay the giants just like the people of old. And Malkitzetek, Malki Zedek, king of Shalem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of El Elyon. Who is who is uh, who is this uh, Melchizedek? You ask. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Book of Yeshar, chapter sixteen, one through twelve. At that time, Kedor Leomer, king of Elam, sent to all the neighboring kings to Nimrod, king of Shinar, who was then under his power, and to Tidal, king of Goyim, and to Ariok, king of Elisar with whom he made a covenant, saying, Come up to me and assist me, that we may smite all the towns of Sodom and its inhabitants, for they have rebelled against me these thirteen years. And these four kings went up with all their camps, about 800,000 men. Okay, there you go. That's the number I was looking for. Okay, so I was close. I think I said, I think I, I, okay, I undershot it. I said maybe five or five thousand, five hundred thousand. Okay, so I undershot it. So about 800,000 men, and they were as they were, and smote every man they found in their road. And the five kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shem Eber, king of Zeboim, Bera, king of Sodom, Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Bela, king of Soar, went out to meet him, and they all joined in the, in the valley of Sidim. And these nine kings made war in the valley of Sidim, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were smitten before the kings of Elam. And the valley of Sidim was full of lime pits, and the kings of Elam pursued the kings of Sodom. And the kings of Sodom with their camps fled and fell into the lime pits. And all that remained went into the mountain for safety. And the five kings of Elam came after them and pursued them to the gates of Sodom. And they took all that were was, was in Sodom. And they plundered all the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they also took Lot, Abram's brother, and his property. And they seized all the goods of the cities of Sodom. And they went their way. And Unik, Abram's servant, who was in the battle, saw this and told Abram all that the king has done to the cities of Sodom and that Lot was taken captive by them. And Abram heard this, and he rose up with about 318 men that were with him, and that night pursued these kings and smote them. And they all, they all fell before Abram and his men, and there was none remaining but the four kings who fled. And they, each, they went each to his own road, and Abram recovered all the property of Sodom, and he recovered Lot and his property, his wives and little ones, and all belonging to him, so that Lot lacked nothing. And when he returned from smiting these kings, he and his men passed the valley of Sedim, where the kings had made war together. And Bera, king of Sodom, and the rest of his men that were with him went out from the lime pits into which they had fallen to meet Abram and his men. And Adonizek, king of Jerusalem, was Shem, went out with his men to meet Abram and his people, bread and wine, and they remained together in the valley of Melech. And Adonizek blessed Abram, and Abram gave him a tenth from all that he had brought from the spoil of his enemies, for Adonizek was a priest before Elohim. So, um, Witness number one, that Melchizedek was Shem. Then you would say Hebrews 7, 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High Elohim, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of Elohim, abides a priest continually. So a lot of people would try to debunk Joshua and say, ah, see, Melchizedek doesn't have a father or mother. Shem had a father and mother, so therefore it's got to be wrong. However, this is where the writings of Abraham comes in and shines and makes the, makes the connection for us. 
So we're going to start all the way back in Writings of Abraham chapter 2. Oops, we're going to have to go this way. So we're going to have to go to Writings of Abraham. We're going to go to chapter 2. Oops, it was too much. Chapter 2. My father, Terah, was the son of Nahor, and Nahor was the son of Serug, and Serug was the son of Reu, and Reu was the son of Peleg, in whose days the earth was divided. Peleg was the son of Eber, who was the son of Eber, who was the son of Salah, who was the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, who was Melchizedek, which by interpretation is king-priest, for he was a king and a priest of the Most High Elohim. Witness number two. Now, let's go to... Um, Let's go to, check this out. This will blow. No, I'm not going to say that. This will be amazing for you to hear. You got to be careful what you say. I don't want anything to blow your mind. I want your mind to be healthy and intact. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh... Yeah, here we go. 96. Therewith I departed from Melchizedek, rejoicing in his blessing. For he was a man of faith who wrought righteousness. And when a child feared Elohim, and by his faith he stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire when those of evil combination sought to destroy him from off the face of the earth. Therefore, having been approved of Elohim, he was ordained a high priest after the order of the covenant which Elohim made with Enoch, which is after the order of the firstborn, even our father Adam. So this priesthood came from Adam, to Enoch, to Noah, to Shem, to Abraham, to Yitzchak, to Jacob, and then at that point it was split off into the priesthood of Levi. And Yahusha came back to restore that priesthood. For this, listen, remember this passage with, with Hebrews. I'm telling you, the apostles got this book. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but may like unto the son of Elohim abides a priest continually. So here's the glue that connects us together. So this text tells us it's Shem. For this holy order, not a specific man, but this holy order came not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of Elohim. It's talking not about a specific man, not talking about talking about Shem, but it's talking about the role of that priesthood. For it was established in the beginning of the earth by the ancient of days, wherefore it is called the order of the ancients. And it was delivered unto men from the beginning by the calling of Elohim's own voice, according to his own will, through the voice of his priesthood, unto as many as believed on his name and were faithful until they had obtained. Wow. Behold, these could transcend the veil according to the will of Elohim and commune with a general assembly of the church and firstborn in heaven, and many were caught up to be with them. For Elohim had sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself that every one being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up the waters, to turn them out of their course, to put to defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of Elohim, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and by this the will of the Son of Elohim, the only begotten of the Father, which was from before the foundation of the world. You don't think Abraham knew about Yahushua? Of course he did. And men having this faith and coming up into this order of Elohim could tran be translated and taken up into heaven. Praise Yah. Now, Melchizedek was a priest after this order, which is the holy order of Elohim. Therefore, he obtained peace and shalom and was called the Prince of Peace. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven, for they sought for the city of Enoch, which Elohim had before taken. This is New Jerusalem. Separating it from the earth and having reserved it unto the latter days or the end of the world. For Elohim had said and sworn with an oath by the, that the heavens and the earth should... Uh, should I'm sorry, let me read. this is a great passage. Let me not ruin this one with my stutter. For Elohim has said and sworn with an oath that the heavens and the earth should come together again and the sons of Elohim be even tried by fire. And thus Melchizedek, having established righteousness, was called the king of the heavens by his people, or in other words, the king of peace. And they communed with those in the city of Enoch and in the city of Peleg and had access to them and were blessed all their days. 99. 
After these things, Elohim appeared to me in a vision. He said to me, Behold, Abraham, it is ten full years since you came to this land from Haran. Two years did you remain then in the land. Seven years were you in Egypt, and one year have you been has it been since you returned from Egypt. Now, number all that you have and see how it is increased to double that which went out with you in the day that you came forth from Haran. Therefore, fear not, for I am with you and will be your help and the source of your strength. I will be your shield and exceeding great reward and your wealth and your possessions shall increase exceedingly. Uh, oh, okay. No, let's we'll stop there. Okay. Um... So we'll see here in the book of Yashar that Abraham, in chapter 9, studied under Noah and Shem after this order of the priesthood. We'll read verses 5 through 9. And when Abraham came out from the cave, he went to Noah and his son Shem, and he remained with them to learn the instruction of Yahuwah and his ways, and no man knew where Abraham was. And Abraham served Noah and Shem his son for a long time. And Abram was in Noah's house 39 years, and Abram knew Yahuwah from three years old, and he went in the ways of Yahuwah until the day of his death, as Noah and his son Shem had taught him. And all the sons of the earth in those days greatly transgressed against Yahuwah, and they rebelled against him, they served other Elohim, and they forgot Yahuwah who had created them in the earth, and the inhabitants of the earth, and made unto themselves at that time every man his Elohim, Elohim of wood and Elm stone, which could neither speak nor hear nor deliver them, and the sons of men served them, and they became their Elohim. Uh, and then the Targums. Targums here of uh, chapter 14. And it was in the days of Amraphel, he is Nimrod, who commanded Abram to be cast into the furnace. There's the other witness. He was then king of Pontus, Ariok, so called because he was tall among the giants of Thalassar. And Malkitzedek, who was Shem, Bar Noah, son of Noah, the king of Jerusalem, came forth to meet Abram and brought forth to him bread and wine, and that time ministered before Elohai. So there's witness number three, that Shem was in fact uh, Melchizedek at that time. He was holding that priest's office. All right, so let's keep going. Give me a little sip here, hang on. All right, so again, in verse 18, Melchizedek uh, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of El Elyon. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. We talked about this a lot in week one, about who he is and declaring what he did. I serve Yahweh, the Most High, and through his son Yahusha, all things were created, heaven, earth, and everything you see in it. And blessed El Elyon, which has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto El Avram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to yourself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I lift up my hand unto El Yahuwah, El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which were with me, Aner, Ashkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So Abraham was tested in this way, and we get that in Jubilee 17, verses 15 through 18. And the prince Mastema, Satan, came and said before Elohim, Behold, Abraham loves Yitzchak his son, and he delights in him above all things else. Bid him to burn him to offer him as a burnt offering on the altar, and you will see if he will do this command, and you will know if he is faithful in everything wherein you do try him. And Yahweh knew that Abraham was faithful in all his afflictions, for he had tried him through his country, right, leaving the country which we started this Torah portion with, and with the famine. And tried him with the wealth of the kings. That's here right now. This is one of his testings. Right? He was tested with uh, being, you know, um, maybe lustful over that uh, treasure. And he had tried him again through his woman. And when she was torn from him, Hagar. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. That's from Sarah when Sarah was pulled away from him. And with circumcision. And tried him through Yishmael and Hagar, his maidservant, when he sent them away. And in everything wherein he had tried him, he was found faithful. And his soul was not impatient. And he was not slow to act. For he was faithful and a lover of Yahuwah. All right. So speaking about, you know, Abraham and being the seed of Abraham. 
Matthew 10, 34-39. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. And he that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Is there anything in our lives that is more important than serving him? We have to be ready to lose everything, to die to self, to serve our Elohim. Because he is Kodesh. He is holy. He is set apart. He is our life. He is the giver of life. He is the creator of all things. His son, Messiah, who shall lay down everything for us. How can we imagine not to lay everything down for him? Think about that for a second. You want to be the seed of Abraham? We need to do the deeds of Abraham. And I'm talking to myself. I really am. Because I'm not perfect. But I want to walk in perfection. I want to strive for perfection with all my heart. Because we have a set apart Elohim that we serve. And we need to be set apart in all our actions. All our thoughts. All our words. Everything that we do with the works of our hands. We need to be mindful. And to be serving him with everything that we have. Praise Yah. He left everything. Uh, Matthew nineteen twenty one through twenty two thirty. Yahushua said unto them, "If you will be perfect, which we should strive for, go and sell that you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me." But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This reminds me of people that have great wealth and worldly wisdom. They're reluctant to give it up, and they won't believe it. And so they stick with their earthly wisdom and they buy from Babylon instead of buying from Yahusha. Then said Yahusha unto his disciples, Verily I say to you that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who, can, who then can be saved? But Yahusha beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with Elohim all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto them, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed you. What shall we have therefore? Just like Abraham did, he forsook everything. And Yahushua said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, or like the restoration of the tribes of Israel, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now listen carefully. Think of anything that could be holding you back from serving him with everything that you have. And everyone that has forsaken Houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Now, is this telling you to go just drop everything like, like that? No, of course not. But if things are getting in your way of serving the Most High with everything that you have, I think you need to take a hard look of, of your life and what's going on. Maybe a lot of prayer and fasting is due in your life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So in a spiritual sense, like we said earlier, selling all that we have and buying what he has to sell with all of our hearts. Maybe there's a time coming where we actually sell our possessions. Maybe those that have abundance need to sell their possessions. The apostles knew something. They read a certain book. I think they had this book. They had the Order of the Ancients, the, the book of Elijah the prophet, and the writings of Abraham that we've been reading through today. The two big, the two great overtones, the things that you just totally glean from it is communal living. Acts 2, 42-47, And they continued steadfast, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together. This is what we need to be doing. We're assembling, brothers and sisters, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, and they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So they did have houses. So they, like, they're still. They still had houses, right, or, or tents or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, uh, regardless, they got together and lived together and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, 
praising Elohim, having favor with all the people, and Yahweh added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Acts 4, 24-37 And when they had heard, they lifted up their voice to Elohim with one accord and said, Yahuwah, you are Elohim, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Here, that's the same declaration. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against Yahuwah and against his Mashiach. For of a truth against thy holy child, Yahusha, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine before ye be done. And now, Yahuwah, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Yahusha. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, and they spake the word of Elohim with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he had possessed was his own, but they had all things common. So they did keep possessions, but it was like for common use. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Yahusha, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and bought the prices, brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according to as he has need. And Joseph, or Yosus, by the who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. <sighs> Praise ya. All right. All right, chapter 15. Yeah, we're just going to we're just going to go through this. Uh give me just one second. Okay. Chapter 15. After these things, the word of Yahuwah, who's that? Messiah. The word of Yahuwah came unto El Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Adonai, Yahuwah, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me you have been given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of Yahuwah came unto him, saying, this shall not be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of your own generation shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heavens and count the stars, if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall your seed be. There's a lot more to that. There's a video that uh, I would recommend watching if you haven't seen it. It's called Enoch 43, Identity of the Stars in Heaven Revealed. Take a look at that. Uh, that's probably one of my favorite studies I ever did. But uh, just to give you a quick breakdown, the Revelation 12, 1 through 5, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and her upon her head a crown of twelve stars, right, for sitting behind the twelve uh, tribes of Israel. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto Elohim. We need to understand who the stars of heaven are. Uh, and actually, uh, the most important one I didn't pull up is Enoch... 43 43 and I saw their lightnings and the stars of heaven and I saw how he called them all by their names and they hearkened to him right hearken unto my voice and I saw how they all weighed in a righteous balance according to their proportions of light just like Messiah said he gave everyone every man according to his several ability I saw the width of their spaces and the day of their appearing. Each star has a day of their appearing on earth. And how their revolution produces lightning. And I saw their revolutions according to the number of the angels and how they keep faith with each other. There's, there's a lot of ancient books that say there's one angel per man. 
And I asked the angel who went with me, uh, who showed me what was hidden, what are these? What are the stars? Straight up. Enoch's like, what are the stars? And he said to me, Yahweh Sabot has showed you their parabolic meaning. These, the stars, are the names of the holy who dwell on the earth and believe in the name of Yahweh Sabot forever and ever. The righteous people are the stars. Not literally, but that's like a, it's like a, a parable for them. That's why they're, they're, some are bigger, some are smaller, some have more light, some have less light. So that's what is actually happening here in Revelation 12. Satan so a, a nation is born into the truth and Satan sweeps away a third of them and casts them to the earth. This isn't the first time that a, a Antichrist figure uh, sweeps away stars of the heaven and casts them to the earth. Daniel 8, 9-10 through 10, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven and they stamped some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. So, Silly question, did Antiochus Epiphanes go up into the firmament and like start like knocking down stars? No, of course not. What did he do? He went into the land of Israel and killed a lot of the holy people. So, you'll never look at Genesis 15 again. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heavens and count the stars. If you're able to number them, he said unto them, So shall your seed be. The seed of Abraham. Up in the, up in the heavens is the seed of Abraham. And if we continue in this doctrine, in the truth, you may look up and see yours one day. Uh, 15.6, And he believed in Yahuwah, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Faith. The, the Hebrew word there, um, believed, right? So what, is, what, is, what does faith even mean? Let's take a look at, at the hall of faith. And what people did. Now faith, Hebrews 11, 1 through 19, and faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of Elohim, so that things which are seen are not, were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto Elohim a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, Elohim testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaks Right, so Abel Abel knew of the righteousness of Elohim, and he knew to give him the best of his crops, the best of his offering. Whereas in Cain was like, mm. by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because Elohim translated him. For before, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased Elohim. How did he please Elohim? Because he was found faithful. He walked in all of the commandments and taught the sons of men truth and righteousness. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to Elohim must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently seek him isn't just going to church once a week and, you know, saying a couple prayers and saying all is well with my soul. Although I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, all will be well. No, it won't. It will not be. By faith, Enoah, being warned of Elohim of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Faith is a verb. There's an action to it. It's not just, I have faith. And do nothing. Hear a little more about Abraham's faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Just believing Elohim. Like, I believe you. I believe you got me. Whatever hard decisions ahead of me, doesn't matter. I believe you've got me. I believe that you are the judge of all and see all and will deliver all those who call upon your name and keep your commandments and believe in your son, Yahushua HaMashiach. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Yitzchak and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is Elohim. He was looking for New Jerusalem back then. Shouldn't we even more so now? Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so as many as the stars in the molted sky of multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. This is this is the this is the characteristics uh, characteristics of faithful people. Are we a faithful people? Are we walking like Abraham? Are we dropping whatever he calls us to at the, at the drop of a hat to do his will? For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, Elohim is not ashamed to be called their Elohim, for he has prepared for them a city, right? So people aren't thirsting after physical Jerusalem and after a lot of people are, are, are told to do so. But that's not, that's not it. That's not the land of promise. The land of promise is coming in the skies with Messiah Husha. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Yitzchak, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Yitzchak shall thy seed be called, accounting that Abel, Elohim was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. That's faith, brothers and sisters. Yahuwah, Most High, we just come before in Yahusha's name, and we thank you, Father, for your word which is a lamp to our feet. Thank you for giving us faith in these last days, true belief. Thank you for showing us the lies of the world and showing us your truth, Father. Your truth is what we are thirsting after for. Father, I pray in Yahusha's name that you give us, anyone that's listening to this, this study, Father, that you give us the faith of Abraham, of Abraham, that we would walk and do the deeds of Abraham and do the deeds of Yahusha to follow the great examples set before us. I ask in Yahushua's name that you bestow upon us this, this gift, Father. Amen. All right. Genesis 15, 7. And he said unto him, I am Yahuwah that brought you out of Ur of the Kazdim to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, I don't know, Yahuwah, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst, and he laid each piece one against another. But the, diverge, the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. You know, it's interesting. The, the land of inheritance that was given to him is roughly this area. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's not too far off from the borders of New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem would probably be more like this. So it's a little bigger than this, but generally that would be it. And if that did that, literally Jerusalem would be the center of New Jerusalem, which would be probably where the temple is, right? Pretty cool, huh? And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. This includes, um, you know, this includes the time of the wanderings in, in uh, Canaan. Also, that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorim is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, the smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And this same day, Yahuwah cut a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Mitzrayim unto the great river, the river Parath. And the Kenanim, and the Kenazim, and the Kadmonim, and the Chitim, and the Perazim, and the Rephaim, and the Emorim, and the Kenanim, and the Gergeshim, and the Yebusim. We're going to read uh, a little bit of... Um, the Targum here, chapter 15, and to see why Yahuwah was like, Yahusha was like, don't be afraid. After these words, when the kings had gathered together and had fallen before Abram, and four kings had been slain, and nine hosts brought back, Abram reasoned in his heart and said, Woe to me, because I have received the reward of my appointments in this world, and have no portion of the world to come. Or peradventure the brethren and friends of those who had been slain will combine in legions and come against me. Or at that time where there was found with me the reward of a little righteousness, so that they fell before me. But the second time, but the second time, reward may not be found with me, and by me the name of the heavens may be profaned. Thereupon was the word of Yahweh with Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, for if these men should gather together in legions and come against thee, my word 
will be your shield. And also, if these fall before you in this world, my reward of thy good work shall be kept, and be prepared before me in the world to come, great exceedingly. So, just a little interesting. I try to pick out little interesting nuggets here and there. All right. Chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's woman, bore him no children, and she had a handmaid, a Mitzri, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto El Abram, Behold now, Yahweh has restrained me from bearing, I pray you, going into my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, and Sarai Abram's woman, took Hagar, her maid, the Mitzrim, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of the Canaanim, and gave her to her man, Abram, to be his woman. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So basically, Hagar got pregnant, and was like, Sarah. <laughs> and Sarai said unto Allah Abram, My wrong be upon you. I have given my maid into your bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Yahweh judge between me and you. But Abram said unto El Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as it pleases you. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of Yahuwah found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence came you, and whither will you go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of Yahuwah said unto her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. And the angel of Yahuwah said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of Yahuwah said unto her, Behold, you are with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahuwah has heard your affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of Yahuwah that spoke to her, You, El, see me. For she said, I have also here looked after him that sees me. Wherefore, the well was called Be'er Lachai Roy which is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar, Hagar, bore Abram a son, and Abram called his name, which Hagar bore, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. So a couple of things here uh, to make the story come alive here. We're going to go to Yashar 16. And read 22 through 27. And Sarai, the daughter of Haran, Abram's wife was still barren in those days. She did not bear to Abram either a son or daughter. And when she saw that she bare no children, she took her handmaid, Hagar, whom Pharaoh had given her, and she gave to Abram her husband for a wife. And Hagar learned all the ways of Sarai as Sarai taught her, and she was not in any way deficient in following her good ways. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, here is my handmaid, Hagar. Go to her that she may bring forth upon my knees, that I may also obtain children through her. And at the end of ten years, Abram's dwelling in the land of Canaan, which is the eighty-fifth year of Abram's life, Sarah gave Hagar unto him. And Abram hearkened to the voice of his wife Sarai, and he took his handmaid Hagar, and Abram came to her, and she conceived. And when Hagar saw that she had conceived, she rejoiced greatly, and her mistress was despised in her eyes. And she said within herself, This can only be that I am better before Elohim than Sarai, my mistress. Right. So here we get the context of what Hagar actually did. For all the days that my mistress has been with my master, she did not conceive. But me, Yahweh, has caused in so short a time to conceive by him. And when Sarai saw that Hagar had conceived by Abram, Sarah was jealous of her handmaid. And Sarai said within herself, This is surely nothing else that she must be better than I am. And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon you. For at the time when you did pray before Yahuwah for children, why did you not pray on my account that Yahuwah should give me seed from you? And when I speak to Hagar in thy presence, she despises my words because she has conceived. And you will say nothing to her. May Yahuwah judge between me and you for what you have done to me. And Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, your handmaid's in your hand. Do unto her as it may seem good to you in your eyes. And Sarai afflicted her, and Hagar fled from her into the wilderness. The Targums reads, But Sarah, the wife of Abram, had not born to him, but he had a handmaid, a Mitzray, and her name was Hagar, daughter of Pharaoh, to whom he gave to him as a handmaid in the time that he received her, being struck by the struck by the word from before Yahuwah, and she gave oh uh, yeah, I'm sorry, and she gave thanks before Yahuwah, whose word spoke with her, which was the angel of Yahuwah, and thus said, You are he who lives and art eternal, who sees but are not seen. For she said, Behold, here he is revealed the glory of the Shekinah, the presence of Yahuwah in a vision. Um, there's a, there's another, um, hold on, 
one second. There's another uh, video I would highly recommend. It's called Identity Angel of Yahuwah. Y H W H. It's called the identity, the angel of Yahuwah. And Genesis 16, which we just read, was a big center point of this study. I uh, highly recommend that as well. Okay, um, chapter 17. Yeah, I'm glad we just, just went through. I forgot the second half of this was a lot, a lot quicker. I was thinking this was going to be like a four-hour tour portion. Yeah, this would be good. Okay, chapter 17. And when Abram was 99 years old, Yahuwah appeared unto El Abram and said unto him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. That's right, he said it. So did Messiah. Matthew 5, 43-48, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Not written, but said. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even publicans the so. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. We have got to be perfect with each other. Praise Yah. We got to. Got to, got to. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and Elohim talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made you. And I will make you exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim unto you and to your seed after you. And I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land wherein you are in a stranger, all the land of the Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their Elohim. Right. So this is, again, this, this land over there, those borders, that's our land forever. And Elohim said unto El Abraham, you shall guard my covenant, therefore, you and your seed after you in their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall guard between me and you and your seed after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every male child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money or any stranger, which is not of your seed. He that is born in your house and he that is bought with your money must needs to be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for what? An everlasting covenant. Doesn't stop. And the, circumcised, un, and the uncircumcised male child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Deuteronomy 16, 10, 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more safe next. So there's two circumcisions. There's a circumcision of the flesh and a circumcision of the heart. And we know that Messiah, Yahushua, when he came and offered himself up for us and through forgiveness and reconciliation in his blood and repentance and baptism, we have the circumcision of the heart. Now here is something, an interesting passage. This is what most people use to do away with circumcision. 1 Corinthians 7, 18 through 20. Is any man called being, uncir being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. I don't agree with that. The way this is written, the way it's translated, I don't agree with that. Um, there's many different ex explanations, and there's a lot of great explanations there out there. Like, well, what Paul was just trying to get across was, you know, you're not saved by circumcision. So you don't just get circumcised and then you're good, Right? And I think, you know, that's what he's trying to portray here. Uh, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of Elohim, which circumcision is a commandment of Elohim. Let every man abide in the same calling when he was called, right? So here's the thing. There's tons of scriptures that shows that we should get circumcised. Uh, here, even in Acts, he circumcised Timothy, Right? Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there called Timotho Tim Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. 
him would Paul have to go with him, go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew that all that his father was a Greek. So Paul was like, Timothy, you know, before we go and preach the good news, you need to be circumcised, my brother. And as though they went through the, and through they went to the cities, they de- uh, delivered them the decrees for the to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And this, remember, this just happened at uh, Acts 15, where they made the decree where supposedly they only gave four commandments to the Gentiles and everything else is kind of done away with. Well, here, right before, after that meeting, and they're about to go preach the good news, he circumcises Timothy, right? So what's up here? If really this is what on the surface it looks like, then he would have been, Timothy, dude, bro, brother, you don't need to get circumcised. It's nothing. It's done away with. But he didn't say that. So remember, if someone tries to use Paul to do away with the commandment, just remember, uh, there's a couple different things. We could totally misunderstand Paul. It could be translation bias. Uh, things It could be inserted in the text by the Roman Catholic Church to push forth certain doctrines. You never know. But here's the thing. We have to test Paul by the scriptures. And we're not testing Paul. We're just testing because I believe he's a true apostle with all my heart. But I'm just saying that the, the, the texts we have today, we have to test those uh, versus the Torah and, and the writings, not test the Torah by Paul's words, vice versa, which is what the church does. Second Peter three fourteen through 17, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, blameless, and account of the long-suffering of our Adonai is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of these, these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, right? Like circumstances is nothing. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do other, other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. This is the only scripture I know in all of scripture that warns about other scriptures. Like, be careful. Deuteronomy 8, 2, And you shall remember all the way which Yahweh the Elohim led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, and to know what was in your heart, whether you'd keep his commandments or no. So perhaps the Most High wanted those scriptures to be written that way to test people. What's in your heart? Right? Are you going to follow this mistranslated words of Paul or misunderstood word of Paul? Or are you going to follow my everlasting decrees? Ezekiel 44, 9, this is prophetic. Thus says Yahweh, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in the flesh shall enter into my sanctuary right? It's both. It's both. It's the circumcision of the heart and the flesh. In my opinion, with we get circumcised of the heart first, and then through a circumcised heart, we want to be obedient and go through the circumcision of the flesh. So if you're out there and you're like, I'm not, and you're not circumcised, hey, I would look into it. If you need somebody, I know somebody that travels the country and does these. He'll come to you. Email me, hello at parableofthevineyard.com. You can get circumcised. Okay. Um, no, right. We need to read that. We're gonna read First Maccabees. We're gonna read about some people that withstood death to make sure their children were circumcised. First Maccabees one forty one through sixty two. Then the king wrote his whole kingdom that all should be one people, one world, one religion that each should give up his customs. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many, even from Israel, gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and feasts, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised and they were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane so that they should forget the Torah and change all the ordinances and whosoever does not obey the command of the king shall die in such words he wrote to his whole kingdom and he appointed inspectors over all the people and commanded the cities of Judah to offer sacrifice city by city many of the people every one who forsook the Torah joined them and they did evil in the land and they drove Israel into hiding in every place of refuge they had now on the fifteenth day of Kislev, in the one hundred and forty fifth year, they erected a desolating sacrilege upon the altar of burnt offering. They also built altars in the surrounding cities of Judah and burned incense at the doors of the houses and the streets. The books of the Torah, which they found, they tore in pieces and burned with fire. Where the book of the covenant was found in the possession of anyone, or if anyone adhered to the Torah, the decree of the king condemned him to death. 
They kept using violence against Israel, against those who's I'm sorry, against those found month after month in the cities. And on the twenty fifth day on the month they offered sacrifice on the altar, which was upon the altar of burnt offering. According to the decree, they put to death the women who had their children circumcised, and their families and those who circumcised them, and they hung the infants from their mothers' necks. But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. Wow. Genesis seventeen fifteen and Elohim said unto El Avraham. Elohim said unto El Abraham, As for Sarai, your woman, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give you a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto Elohim, O that Ishmael might live before you. And Elohim said, Sarah, your woman, shall bear you a son indeed, and you shall call his name Yitzchak, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Yishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Yitzchak, with Sarah shall bear unto you at this set time of the next year. And he left off talking with him, and Elohim went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in this selfsame day, as Elohim had said unto him. And Abraham was nine years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised, and Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money in the stranger, were circumcised with him. Now, let's take a look at the Targums. There's some interesting little nuggets here. We get the, we get the true concept of how this covenant was formed. Um, and you'll see that it was through the Father, but through Yahusha the whole time, the Word. And Abraham was the son of 90 and 9 years old. This is the Aramaic Targums. And Yahuwah appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Serve before me and be perfect in the flesh. And I'll set my covenant between my word, which is Yahusha, and you. And I'll multiply you very greatly. And because Abraham was not circumcised, he was not able to stand. But he bowed himself upon his face. And Yahuwah spake with him, saying, Behold, I have confirmed my covenant with you. And you shall be the father of many peoples. And thy name shall be no more called Abraham, but Abraham shall be thy name. Because to be the father of a great multitude of peoples have I appointed you, and I will make you exceeding fruitful, and I will set you for congregations, and kings ruling over peoples shall come forth from you. And I have established my covenant between my word, so basically Yahusha and you, and thy sons after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be an Elohim to you and to your sons after you. Uh, skipping down here. This is my covenant that you shall observe between my word and you. Right? Praise you. And again, down here, it shall be my covenant in your flesh for a covenant forever. Praise ya. So, Abraham got a new name. Sarah got a new name. One day, we will receive a new name. Some people already feel like they have. A lot of people change their name in the Torah movement. <laughs> I haven't been directed as such as yet, but maybe one day. Or maybe I'll just stay Adam. I don't know. Maybe it'll be Adam Adam Ham. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, bad joke. Any case. <clears throat> um, so I, I pray that this uh, portion of the study about Abraham, faith, uh, walking out that faith, uh, forsaking all to follow him, uh, following him with all of our heart, soul, and might to be like the seed of Abraham and to do like Abraham, 
to walk as the true fulfillment of the seed of Abraham, like uh, Yahusha, our Messiah, uh, to do with all of our heart, soul, and mind. I pray that Yah gives you the strength, gives us the strength to do so, to walk forward, and to walk towards perfection in his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, we come before you and bless you on this Shabbat. We thank you for all that you do. You are a true blessing and amazement to our souls, Father. You have, you're everything we've searched for our entire lives. Your son, Yahusha, your word, your Torah, your prophets, your writings, all of it, Father. This is what we've been looking for all of our lives. As Yahusha said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. Father, truly, this, this saying is coming to fruition with us, Father. We love you so much, and we just thank you for filling our hearts, Father, filling our soul with truth that we lack nothing. Father, we just ask that you continue to look over us, Father, especially as this world continues to go the direction it goes. Father, protect us just like you protect your children in Goshen, Father, from all harm. Father, we love you and bless you and praise you as you and all those that are in heaven are also Shabbating and rejoicing. May we do the same down here on earth, Father. We love you and bless you and praise you and thank you with all that we have. In Yahushua's name, amen. Shabbat shalom, brethren. Uh, we're going to play a couple songs for you. I pray they're a blessing for you. And uh, Shabbat shalom. Let's do with start with the priestly blessing. No, we'll, we'll end with the priestly blessing. So let's start with the new songs. We gather round in Lebanon The constant sound
upon me. 